welcome to this video on the economic change and development that took place between 1890 and 1920. We're going to break it down really into two parts, 1890 until 1913, and then the impact of World War One. So, as an overview, we call this period the Second Industrial Revolution. It saw a huge change to America, massive technical developments from the years 1880 until 1920. Uh, there was new industries such as electro electric power, engineering, oil, chemicals, modern communications, etc. And it really did fuel the economic growth that we see in the period that we call the progressive area. By 1913, the USA was a net exporter of goods as a result of two surges in manufactured exports. Firstly, 90% increase between 1895 and 1900. And secondly, a 77% increase between 1908 and 1913. A net exporter means it's, t it's sending more goods out, producing more profit for the country, and we see an increase in their GDP and the economy. Now, two charts that highlight this. We've got the iron and steel production as a combined unit total. We can see that Britain dominates in 1875, but by the end, 1910, America is producing more than Germany and Britain combined, the two largest European powers. And that just highlights the extent to which America's economy developed in this period. Secondly, we've got world steel output. We can see that, again, America dominates with 31.5 million tonnes produced each year, again, surpassing Germany and Britain, France and Russia all combined. And we see this output has a massive increase in the US economy. It can be used internally to build more railroads as well as producing other goods. And it can be sold to the countries such as Germany and Britain, France, Russia, when World War Two breaks out, uh, World War One breaks out. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for the explosive growth of the American economy. We break them down into efficiency, labor supply, natural resources, politics, geo geogra geography, and the growth of infrastructure. We're gonna delve into these in a little bit more detail now. So in terms of efficiency, we can see that Frederick Winslow Taylor observed uh, increased mechanization, improved efficiency, particularly in steel. That meant workers were spending less time uh, less time spent on sort of more complex things so they were doing simpler tasks more quickly and therefore they could produce more we've got increased mechanization of industry and improvements to worker efficiency then means we can undercut the need for skilled labor and again this produces more economic development and lastly the railroads give rise to the development of modern management techniques so we've got chain of command statistical reporting and bureaucratic systems and this is then echoed in other types of industries across the americas now, in terms of labour supply, we've got urbanisation that we'll come to in the next lecture. Massive amounts of urbanisation. For example, New York City doubles between 1890 and 1910, and again doubles again. By 1900, there are 38 cities with a huge population of over 100,000. That means there's more people, more markets to buy, and it's more uh, densely populated, which again means that you only have to send goods to one location for them to be sold and it's also a huge supply of labor, so they link in together. Massive amounts of uh, natural resources in America, high-grade iron ore in Masabi, uh, oil fields in California, Oklahoma, and Texas, 1890, the Alaska-Yukon Gold Rush and the Nome Gold Rush, doubles the size of the US gold reserves, and again, creates an economic stimulus in the West and other parts of America. So, so far, we've got favorable politics as well of the progressive period. When we do look into the progressive presidents, you see attempts at regulation, but there's nothing major that's been done. There is only limited regulation in businesses, government at state and federal level. There's also large subsidies from these governments that provide money to the railroad companies. They are also able to borrow heavily by selling stocks. And again, this further sort of short term uh, impetus for the growing economy. We've got the Supreme Court breaking down some of the decisions made by the progressive um, laws. Again, that prevents regulation of working conditions. And again, we can see railroad cut rates for large shippers. Geographic position, America is uniquely placed to take advantage of a new global economy. It's part of world shipping routes and it invests heavily in its port systems, particularly in the South and the East Coast. Again, Canada and Latin America are peaceful countries with America, that meant they've got a relatively domestic market in which to sell their goods to. A war with Spain is further drive for the econ economic growth. 
infrastructure. By 1885, the telegraph is the backbone of the network. It means the United States is connected and that means we can share profits, etc. Again, we've got the railroad growth that meant we can send things easily and there's new innovations. An excellent transport network, for example, increases steel production by 400% in 1913. Regional divisions, though, this is where we get into a bit more complex complexities of this economic growth. It isn't easy to say that America experienced unprecedented boom in this period because the South, yes, there is urbanization. You've got places like Texas, Louisiana, cities such as New Orleans are growing, Houston, Atlanta too. But it continues to be dominated by plantation systems, particularly King Cotton. And they've got their own uh, problems with sharecropping, etc. Urbanisation moves very slowly and on a much smaller scale than in the northeast. The Western economy, again, is very distant and isolated. isolated. Yes, we've got the connections of railroads, but it's heavily dependent on financial interest and investment from the east. There are significant weaknesses to the economy, and again, we're going to break these down further. Economic expansion was not continuous and smooth. It was focused very much in the big cities there were poor regions particularly across the Appalachia Um, growth was punctuated by periods of depression that we'll examine in a moment and the conditions that the populists and the progressives rally against means that ordinary workers join together and create trade unions and we see huge amounts of industrial action that takes the form of strikes the stock market and banking system there is no um, single bank there is no um, Bank of America And so it's unreliable and unstable, and we can see that in the panics of 1893 and the Depression of 1907. And again, this causes further reaction to big businesses. The panic of 1893, the causes were a slowing down of the railroad boom, boom, the fall in gold reserves. Again, Britain pulls out its investors in 1890, and a lack of government resources due to veteran benefits from the Civil War and the War with Spain. 74 railroads failed uh, as a result of this and over 15,000 commercial institutions and 600 banks failed as a result. Now, Secondly, we've got the depression that followed, the panic of 1893 and the failure of the railroads. It led to industrial unemployment, circa 20 to, 20, uh, 20 to 25%, starvation in uh, rural areas and further decline in agricultural prices. For example, corn halved in price. Wheat went from 84 cents to 51 cents a bushel. Thirdly, we've got examples such as the Pullman strike in 1894, huge wage cuts in the Pullman company. It led to anger and effects of the Depression, and the federal government um, was felt that it had not done enough to care about its working class people. But the strike failed. Federal troops were called in by President Cleveland that resulted in the deaths of protesters, and that increased his, uh, increased his hostility between the trade unions. Industrial classes turn towards populism um, and later progressivism. It's one of the reasons for why we see the growth of the Populist Party and how they're able to secure the nomination for the Democratic presidential candidates. And it leads to the Omnibus Indictment Act that permits the legal banning of strikes. So as a result of the deaths and as a result of the protest and the struggles that was caused by the 1894 Pullman strike, the government passes a law that allows companies to ban strikes. And lastly, we've got the panic of 1907. This was caused by weaknesses in the banking system and the the collapse of the third largest trust, the Knickerbocker Trust. The result was New York Stock Exchange fell by 50% over a very short period, and it was only bailed out by JP Morgan, putting up millions of his own money to restore business confidence. Uh, As a result of this, Woodrow Wilson introduced the Federal Reserve to further limit these panics to try and prevent them in the future. So we've got clearly four examples where we can say that the economic growth in this period was not continuous, it was intermittent and then it was interspersed with these panics, depression and um, strikes. Now one area that we could say that there was significant growth, and we may even call it a golden age, is in agriculture. Again, this chart shows you world wheat production as a percentage of world trade and you can see America really starts to dominate by 1900 and is going to be further increased by the effects of World War I. Equally, Germany and Britain's um, production really falls as they move to a different kind of economy. Now, we might be able to call it the Golden Age because it does increase significantly between 1900 and 1918. That's in part by the export to World War I, but that's also due to the increased and expanding domestic economy. These new urban, urban cities 
meant that there was larger markets for the produce and it meant it was easier to distribute. Modernization and mechanization also helped farmers' cooperatives. And there was government action. We've got the Reclamation Act of 1902, the Meat Inspection 1906, and the Federal Farm Loans Act of 1916. So above all of this, agricultural um, success in this period can be called a golden age. From 1905, there was parity in the relationship between agricultural prices and incomes. It meant that farmers now had purchasing power, buying power, and it enabled large increases in cultivated land that led to a boom that was su uh, supplied by the demand. This increases output of wheat and corn. World War I significantly changes the American economy in this period as well. So America is boosted by the consequences of World War I in Europe. It is a stimulus for the US economy that was actually in depression by 1914. The example of this is Baldwin Locomotive Company, produces over 5,500 military locomotives and over 6 million artillery shells. Now remember, America doesn't join the war until 1917, so this is all being exported to France, Britain and Russia and is being sold for profit. American farmers are further able to export produ uh, produce to Europe as their economies turn towards um, war rather than agriculture. And JP Morgan and company and other um, banks send agreements with bank French bankers and the Bank of England for war bonds. In fact, America becomes the sole uh, distributor of war bonds, which means there is an incentive to fuel one side of World War I, and we're going to see the benefits of that. So overall, what does this look like when we time to address a question? One example question might be the most important force controlling the boom and bust of the US economy in the period 1890 to 1913 was the federal government. So within this essay, you'd have to address the federal government, you have to address the Meat Inspection Act, etc., the types of laws that were introduced by the progressive presidents in order to curb, boom and bust, to try and reduce the power of the big businesses such as JP Morgan and um, Vanderbilt, etc., but you have to contrast that with other factors. So you could talk about the growth of trade unions. You've got the growth of regional divisions, the growth of business and efficiency, resources, location. And you can talk about um, trade unions such as the Homestead, Pennsylvania in 1892, Great Northern Strike in 1893, led by an American hero, um, Eugene Debs, who's going to run for president very soon. We've got the Pullman Strikes in Illinois in 1894. Uh, the Great Depression, the Panic of 1907 and the Federal Reserve. So all of these go together to show you that it isn't just the federal government that's controlling the boom and bust. You can also start to um, question the question by saying, did they really um, control this period? You could say that the Depression, the Panic, the Knickerbocker uh, Trust falling really are examples of, of inaction by the federal government that allows for these things to happen. So it's an interesting question that has many different ways of approaching it and different ways in which we can answer and question and produce an outcome. So overall, economic change in this period. Yes, there was significant improvement with the second industrial revolution. That's, yes, America by the end of the period was a net exporter. It was boosted by World War One. But there was regional divisions, there was huge growth in the trade unions, and we see this reflected in the move towards progressivism by the US presidents. Thank you very much.